How's it going, everybody? My name is Cody, uh, and today we are going to be taking a look at this little presentation uh, called Creating Tools for Metal Manufacturing with Stratasys 3D Printing. Uh, so a lot of people are probably pretty well acquainted with Stratasys 3D Printing. The plot we're going to be looking at mostly plastic 3D printing. Um, and we're pretty much just going to be looking at FDM technology, just fused deposition modeling. Um, so I feel like everyone probably has a pretty good idea um, of how that works. Um, that's just a normal plastic extrusion process with a filament on a spool. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about how 3D printing works, and I'm not. I'm also not going to spend a lot of time talking about how each of these manufacturing processes work. Um, just kind of assume that if it's if it's an industry you're in, you understand how it works. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, obviously feel free to type them in chat, and we can answer them at the end. So the goal here is to replace traditional metal tooling with 3D printed tools, plastic 3D printed tools. Pretty straightforward. Um, like the title suggested, we're going to first talk about um, the metal parts manufacturing, uh, so sheet metal forming, and then getting some casting, like sand casting and investment casting. Um, and then just because we have some more time, I'm going to talk about some other manufacturing processes that typically use metal tools um, and where we can replace those metal tools with these 3D printed tools. Um, so some plastics molding, thermoforming, and composite tooling um, are just some of the few, and we'll talk about those. So to start us off, we'll look at our metals. So sheet metal forming. Uh, we're looking, talking more about hydroforming and rubber pad pressing, um, which is this is interesting. It's actually, although it's really counterintuitive, uh, the high pressure nature of these forming methods um, actually give us an opportunity to make sheet metal parts from very lightweight plastic tools um, produced from FDM. Uh, so comparatively, there's normally these tools are made from machined metal, um, and they, they take a long time. They're very, uh, there's a lot of labor involved. Um, if you're outsourcing machining, that obviously can take a lot longer. That's kind of the general issue with a lot of these tools that we're going to be looking at today is that a lot of them are machined. They're all machined. Um, and a lot, of them, a lot of times they're going to need to be outsourced, which can take four, six, eight weeks and cost thousands of dollars. Um, so that's generally the, 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 uh, the pain point that we're going to be addressing with these tools. Um, so FDM in this case is a much quicker approach. Uh, it's less expensive, a lot less labor intensive. Um, and it's totally automated. So the machine's making the tool for you. You're not doing anything. Um, so it, it's really it's an interesting alternative um, for any repair or refurbished work uh, they're doing, or it, which is often found with, say, aging aircrafts. Um, and it's also really useful for products with a high probability of design revisions. Um, and the reason why this is really an advantage uh, is because we can make quick iterations um, of these tools in a, in a matter of days, even day of, um, rather than if you had to make a whole new iteration of a tool that you just got after waiting six weeks, that's another six weeks you have to wait to get a new tool. So, um, specifically for hydroforming and rubber pad pressing, Stratasys has proved out the technology before um, with a variety of materials and thicknesses. Uh, so you can see here with aluminum, we've done some uh, 2024 at different gauges and stainless and even titanium um, up to a certain thickness. As you can see that little chart there. So that's actually, you can kind of see in the pictures on the right, that's the the, the flat piece of stamped, uh, looks. I think that was stainless or possibly aluminum, um, and then the shape formed uh, part just below it. So these Tools that we're making are generally going to be made out of either ABS, polycarbonate, or Ultem. Um, and this really just depends on the pressures that we're looking at. Um, with, with our strongest material, the maximum forming pressure that we're going to withstand is 10,000 PSI, or uh, 69 megapascals. Uh, and then for rubber pad pressing, no more than 1,000 ton rubber pad press. Uh, and then generally, these parts are going to be, you know, anything that has a tolerance that's greater than a uh, ten-thousandth of an inch or a quarter of a millimeter. Um, and just so we're kind of on the same page, tool life, you know, generally we're looking at tool life of a, about hundreds of cycles, not tens of thousands of cycles. Uh, so lower volume production, you know, this is definitely not going to be a replacement for your extremely high volume production parts. Um, and large parts are possible, but generally we're looking at parts. It's been proved out for 16 inches, 16 inches um, 
or smaller in the wide or long. Um, and when we're doing rubber pad pressing, uh, less than three inches deep for our tools. A couple uh, things when we're looking at hydroforming specifically is that uh, can, there's really not too many changes you have to make. Uh, you can really use a lot of your conventional tool design practices with only slight adjustments. Um, one, one adjustment that, that is a pretty obvious one to see is the adjustment to our spring back compensation. Um, so under forming pressures, an FDM tool is going to have a small amount of give. It's going to have a little bit of a deflection, um, more, a lot more so than a metal tool would. Uh, so because of that, we don't need to compensate for the spring back nearly as much. So you can see in figure 13, a uh, conventional metal form block uh, is going to have that slight uh, inset or angling uh, just to compensate for the spring back. And with our FDM block, it, it needs little, sometimes doesn't need any spring back uh, compensation at all. So uh, to avoid overcompensation, generally we'll just start with a tool that has no, no angle at all, and then we can adjust it from there. We can either print an all-new tool or just like you would with a metal form block, we can just machine our 3D printed tool down um, and add that compensation if we need to. Uh, so you can see the um, different pressure ranges of it, uh, that we've proved out for different materials, ABS up to 3,000 PSI, polycarbonate 3,000 to 8,000, and Ultem up to 10,000 PSI. Uh, in this image below uh, with the green lines, that is a cross-sectional view of the layers might be kind of hard to see, but what we do is we can uh, print a very, very solid, dense parts, and that's what allows us to, uh, to, to withstand these high pressures. Um, so what we're doing is we're doing a high density uh, inside fill, as well, as well as adding extra contours along the outside just to make our part more rigid. Here's a customer story. Each, at the end of each one of these, I'm going to give a quick customer story. So Piper Aircraft, uh, they design and manufacture single engine planes. Uh, for personal and business aircrafts. Um, and they use hydroforming to produce hundreds of aluminum uh, aircraft structural components. Um, and m the machining these geometrically complex form tools are, were very expensive due to the amount of time required uh, for programming each of these parts and the high cost of the machine time and the skilled labor required to write the CNC. Uh, and so you can see how much they were able to save by switching over to uh, an FDM tool. So it took them at least 14 days to get a CNC machine tool from CAD to actual tool, um, whereas to get the final tool they need for FDM only took them four and a half days. So that's a huge time savings um, that really multiply, you know, depending on how many tools you have to do. All right, moving on to the next one, look at sand casting. Uh, so we can use sand casting to replace the machine tools, the mold in this case, uh, the mass or the patterns, sorry. Um, so we can design the parts in with a gate and runner built in. Um, we can design custom fit gate and runners to an already made match plate. We can do the match plates and split molds, um, all sorts of things we can do. But really, we can, we're reducing the cost of the pattern and the lead time to get those patterns. Um, so it's really a best fit when you're casting these verification. So if we're doing multiple iterations or you're prototyping your, um, your castings, um, rather than doing six or seven machined uh, machine the match plates, we can do six or seven 3D printed ones in a lot less time and much cheaper. And it's a lot more useful for complex and large castings. Um, we're not really ever going to be doing anything the size of jewelry or anything like that. So FDM really, is a good fit for sand casting uh, with, again, low to moderate casting volumes, less than 5,000 castings. Um, so unlike, you know, unlike investment casting, sand castings, the, the, the match plates and the patterns are reusable. So we can get multiple cycles out of these, uh, just like in the thermoforming. So it's best for prototypes and pilot runs, and we have seen some low-volume production runs um, done with sand casting. Uh, it's really only, only typical we're going to see compaction pressure less than 3,000 PSI, um, is because a lot of times we're going to be looking at uh, ABS molds or polycarbonate, just because we want to finish them and sand them and make them smooth. Um, and on that note, the features, uh, features of the match plates really need to be accessible for finishing. Um, since 3D printing generally has some layer lines and some things like that, we really need to be able to smooth them out and sand them and seal them. Uh, if you can't get to those features, you're going to tear the sand in the mold and you're going to get a bad part if that, if that sand tears out. Um, so we're, only, and we're not going to be doing any, uh, any sort of single 
part. It's only going to be split patterns, match plates, and then the runner and gate systems. So like I said, sanding and uh, polishing your parts is going to be really important when we're looking at sand casting with FDM. Um, that's why we really recommend ABS is as our go-to material because it's the easiest, easiest to finish and it's low cost and we can still uh, use utilized compaction pressures up to 3,000 PSI. We can, if we need to, we can get into old 10, uh, you know, for a 10,000 PSI compaction pressure, but we're still generally going to be looking at a green sand process or a no-bake sand process. So uh, generally, you're going to be looking at this the under the 3,000 PSI range. So here's Mel Melron Corporation. They're, uh, they really paved the way for sand casting with FDM. So Melron Corporation manufactures windows and door hardware, uh, including project in hardware, project out hardware, casements, hinges, strikes, all that. So in the past, they've hired subcontractors out to machine all of their match plates from aluminum uh, and generally costed approximately $5,000 per match plate. Um, the lead time was three to four weeks. So uh, when Melron started on a small scale uh, by actually ordering FDM match plates from the service bureau, and it worked out so well that the company uh, bought itself an FDM machine and began to produce match plates themselves. So the cost of producing these FDM match plates uh, was only $2,000 um, per match plate. And a lot of that is, is going to be uh, finishing and sanding. You know, material-wise, we're probably only looking at a few hundred dollars, but then having doing some of that post-process work um, to sand it and seal it and make sure we get a good uh, cast out of it. But it's still a 60% reduction um, from the CNC machining cost-wise, and uh, their lead time was about cut in half. So a key advantage to this match plate uh, is that it can serve as a prototype to perfect the casting process, and then your final cast, you can go back and do your machined one, and you only have to do that once. Uh, another advantage is, and, and you can see Meron has taken advantage of this, is, uh, is that the runner and gate system can be incorporated into the match plate. So typically, these runner and gate systems uh, are incorporated um, with a lot of hand-on hand work. Um, they're machined by hand or sanded and carved by hand. Uh, so being able to just interchange different runner and gate systems and play with those um, from a 3D printed gate system rather than by hand saves a lot of hands-on time as well. All right, next one is investment casting. So we can do sparse-filled FDM or thin-walled polyjet parts um, to replace the injection-molded wax pattern um, used in investment casting. So polyjet, if you're not aware, polyjet is a totally different process than FDM. Uh, polyjet utilizes sort of an inkjet-style technology. That we, have, we have print heads that are jetting out droplets of a UV curable resin, and then a UV light goes and cures those. So it's a totally different process than FDM, um, totally different materials as well. So with polyjet, we're really we're going to be looking at just a few certain cases where polyjet um, plays well with investment casting. Typically, we'll be looking at FDM, and there's a lot of the same benefits and uh, benefits when uh, 3D printing these tools. Um, no tooling delay, no tooling expense. So in this case, we're actually skipping the tooling process. So with investment casting, we know that generally we have a uh, a, a wax injection molded part. So First, the mold has to be machined, and then we have to inject it with the wax. Then the wax gets coated uh, in the ceramic slurry, and then you burn, and then you melt out the wax. In this case, we're completely skipping the injection molding process and just printing our pattern out of ABS plastic, usually. And so ABS can then just be burnt out. Um, similar to how wax would be, there are some considerations and some things to change. You're going to have about a 0.2 to 0.5 percent um, uh, ash content in there, so it will wash out the ash. Um, but uh, we can much e much more easily do design changes um, rather than having to completely change over our injection mold tooling. So again, it's always really a best fit for these low volume productions um, and for the prototyping and process refinement or bridge to production. And also for complex designs, that makes injection molding extremely expensive and difficult. Uh, and also, it allows us to do some consolidated parts or assemblies that we otherwise just wouldn't be able to do uh, in one part. So we do have some, some feature sizes and some minimum sizes um, that we want to look at. And so you can kind of see in this image here, 
this looks like an STL with the cross sections kind of in the middle. So that's the internal structure um, of our FDM part. So we can do, you can kind of see it's like a sparse or a hollow fill. Um, so that just allows the part to burn out much easier because most of the part is mostly air at that point, which is the, with this an outer shell. Uh, and the parts on the right, so those are, those are polyjet patterns that were used to produce the investment castings. So you can see those are much thinner walls, so that's pretty much going to be the only time we're going to be able to want to use polyjet. So we have very thin walls and some small parts. Um, polyjet material doesn't hold up nearly as well as actual FDM thermoplastics, and it also doesn't burn out as, neat, as nicely. So small parts, thin walls for polyjet, and then all other are going to be our FDM plastics, and it's always going to be our ABS plastic is, is going to be our go-to for that. So here is RLM Industries. They are a leading supplier of investment castings to the military, construction, food processing and handling, and the automotive industry. Uh, and the company is capable of pouring virtually any ferrous or non-ferrous alloy uh, as an investment casting. So pretty, pretty expansive company. Um, but recently, a, a major manufacturer of components and assemblies for the military found itself uh, in danger of missing some critical deadlines. Uh, because they just couldn't produce the investment castings um, that met drawing specs in time. Uh, the original foundry was doing the in, using injection molding to produce these casting patterns as typical. Um, and this, could, this process could take up to two months and cost five to $20,000 um, just to make the injection molds to prepare for investment casting. Uh, so RLM's customers needed, this, needed a faster, less expensive solution. Um, and then they helped pioneer this approach to use FDM to create this uh, ABS investment casting pattern. So what, kind of a, a double whammy is that the, the FDM patterns uh, also gave a, a re perfect representation of the final part so they could use those to fit in the assemblies before they even went into the investment process just to fit the plastic part, um, do a sort of a, uh, a check with the assemblies and make sure things are all working together. Uh, and then they could actually go into the casting process and the investment casting process. Uh, and the cost to make these patterns were only about $1,200, $1,250 to produce these patterns. And the typical lead time um, was only about a week. So they began, uh, they began the project just by modifying the CAD model, making these sparse uh, 3D printed parts as sparse as they could, uh, and then burned them out just like they normally would, dealt with the ash with just another washout step, uh, and then they moved immediately into production um, with the first prototype casting using these FDM parts. And you can see here what the kind of their results were. So their injection molded five to $20,000 that took up to two months. Um, the part itself only cost about $16. So these, these little FDM plastic parts really don't cost much. So you can see there's quite a difference in savings there. So that was it for our metal manufacturing processes, but as we all know, there are a lot of other manufacturing processes out there, a lot of plastics out there that utilize uh, metal tools. So we're going to take a look at some of the other circumstances where we can replace metal tools with our 3D printed plastic tools. So I'm going to talk about plastic moldings, thermoforming, and some composites tooling. Injection molding pretty much the most widely used manufacturing process in the world is for plastic parts. Um, so we can actually 3D print using, and this is more using the polyjet uh, technology, is we can 3D print the plastic molds um, for short, short run production. So we're always going to be looking at low cost or prototypes or short run tooling, typically in this case only 10 to 100 parts, just because the polyjet material is not as strong uh, as our FDM material is. But we can produce our parts in final production plastics. So a lot of times people want to, pr want to just use 3D printing just for um, prototyping the part itself, uh, which can be great, but you're not always going to get your final plastic material that you actually is going to be your end-use product. So use, utilizing 3D printing for your mold itself will make sure you're actually getting your final plastic and getting your most realistic um, prototype closest to your end-use part. And again, it's a lot cheaper and easier to modify and reprint your molds than it is to get them CNC, especially if they're very complex. 3D printing, the more complex your part is, it doesn't matter. It's the same price, same cost, if it's complex or simple. Um, whereas we all know machining, that is not the case. The more complex it is, the price drastically goes up. 
Uh, so when we are looking at injection molding, uh, doing these 3D printed molds, uh, molding temperatures can't exceed 300 degrees C. Uh, we can't do some of the more tougher materials. I mean, we can do some glass-filled nylons, but that's going to be kind of at the top range as far as uh, strength of um, injected plastic. So usually your uh, ABS and PPE, stuff like that. So here's a quick overview or comparison between these. So obviously, traditionally, we're machining the tools, doing the design, the CNC, and the milling, or EDM, uh, or we're doing casting tooling. But in this case, we are just printing out the molds, fitting them in our match plate, or fitting them into our, um, our standard plate. Uh, there's a term for it that I can't remember. Um, but a lot of time and cost savings. And this doesn't just apply to just injection molding. We also see uh, blow molding. Um, being used in the, in the same way. And that can actually be used with polyjet or FDM for blow molding since the tolerances are sometimes not as high with blow molding. Um, but by replacing the machine tool with the FDM, uh, we, can, we can do the same thing that we would do with injection molding. In this case, for blow molding, there's usually it's a two-step process. There's you injecting uh, plastic into a mold, and then you're blowing air into it. So we're actually going to be, we can replace that secondary mold so the, the final form mold is what we're going to be replacing, not the initial injection mold. But that still allows you to uh, do a lot more iterations a lot faster and much cheaper. Three D printed thermoforming molds. So I've seen this actually used quite a bit here in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, FDM thermoforming tools can really be produced in just a fraction of the time. Um, and a lot less hands-on work because we can build in vent holes uh, to eliminate all the manual drilling um, that's necessary for when you're doing thermoforming. Um, and we can do a lot smoother parts with a little or no finishing, very stable and heat-resistant tool when we do something, when we're using this, these old tendon tools. Um, and it's very cost-effective. Again, it's always going to be cost-effective most for low-volume and complex tooling. So in this case, this picture is showing our old tem. Uh, material being used just because that is our most high temp, lowest CTE um, material. But we could, we could also use some other materials like polycarbonate as well um, in that thermoforming process. Even we've seen in low temperature thermoforming processes, we've, all, we've also seen uh, ABS being used. Uh, and I've had something similar to thermoforming is uh, um, you know, vacuum forming or also paper pulp molding. Uh, paper pulp molding being used for all the, the packaging and logistics industry um, can also be used in the same way about while we're, um, we can print these sparse, these very, very hollow parts um, that have, are very porous, and that allows vacuum to be just sucked right through the part. So it's actually much easier to use and to manufacture than it would be um, to CNC the aluminum one, and it works just as well. Uh, and in this case, the reforming generally, we're actually going to have a lot longer tool life as well. It's just not as, uh, not as much pressure involved as it is, say, with uh, hydroforming. So we have customers that are using tools just as long as they would um, their metal tools in this case. Three D printed layup molds. So we all know composites and carbon fiber are going to give us the highest strength to weight ratio for any of your parts, um, and run into the, some of the same problems is that some of these toolings uh, being made for, to make these lamp molds are just extremely complicated. They can be very expensive and time-consuming to make. Um, but if we're using our Ultem materials, we have a spe special material that was developed really just for this called Ultem 1010 with a very low coefficient of thermal expansion um, as far as plastics go. Um, it's extremely low, so it's really nice and uh, easy to use for these layup molds. Um, reduces a lot of lead time, reducing costs. Um, and these, these inert molds uh, don't inhibit curing because we can make them, as you can kind of see in that top picture, we can make them hollow, which just allows, uh, uh, allows the curing process to be, the heat transferred it through a lot better during the curing process. So it doesn't inhibit curing like a normal mold might. Um, and same thing, there are many high temperature thermoplastics that we use, like this, like, like this old thin material, um, to prevent any distortion or anything like that. And something else that you may not consider about a lot of these tools are also a lot safer to use because they don't weigh 200 pounds, 300 pounds. You know, these, these are just plastics. Anyone can lift them up. They're a lot safer to handle and easier to use in that sense. So uh, here's uh, Dassault or Dassault Falcon. 
um, they're disrupting the supply chain. So by reducing their tooling lead time um, by producing these FPM tools. So you can see their original fiber reinforced tooling cost them forty to sixty thousand dollars for one of these tools. Um, their lead time was ten to fourteen weeks, and it weighs over one hundred and fifty pounds. And you can kind of see if anything needed to be changed on that tool, it would not be very easy to change. They might have to scrap the tool completely uh, if it isn't if it didn't turn out exactly how they wanted. And they can't test it until they're finished with the tool. Uh, so with the FDM tooling, uh, the cost was only twenty five hundred dollars. The build time was forty hours, and that build time was completely hands off, hands free. No one needs to be in attendance, uh, and the part only weighs fifteen pounds. So you can see there's a lot of savings involved in that, and, and whether or not that's for low production or just for prototyping, it's still a lot better than waiting 14 weeks and spending $50,000. Sacrificial tooling. This is something that uh, is really pretty much unique only to uh, FDM. And what we're doing is we're going to be actually printing our mandrel or our, our sort of our mold process um, out of a material that is uh, soluble in a solution. So these, that means that we can print our mold and then wrap our, make our com composite parts um, by just uh, wrapping uh, or laying up filament or doing a composite layup or a filament winding around our, uh, around our hollow structure. And then the tool is just removed by washing it out or breaking it away. So you can see in that image the, the white on the inside, that's a trapped tool. So if that was metal or any other plastic, you wouldn't be able to get that tool out. You wouldn't be able to use your part at all. But because we can wash, we can make that a hollow part and we can wash it out uh, and dissolve that ma uh, material away with the solution, now we're left with just our composite part. So you can see here kind of that, that internal structure of that, of that sacrificial tool. Don't need any additional tooling. Um, it really it al allows the designer to create much more complex designs that previously there was just no way to, to get your tools out there. Your tools would be always trapped. Um, so it's very cost effective for low volume, complex production tooling, um, and really gives you a lot better part quality and surface finish than some of the other methods. Uh, and this just allows you to design uh, parts, if it's, say, if it's automotive, you can design for a lot better airflow. Um, and you can also, because these uh, materials are going to be fairly smooth and we can sand them and smooth them prior to wrapping the, uh, you know, wrapping the composite around it, uh, that'll just give us a lot better internal surface area compared to a lot of other methods as well, which leads to uh, better airflow, it leads to stronger parts, a lot less labor um, post-production. And uh, these 3D printed cores can withstand a lot greater mechanical stresses than some other tooling might. Here's one company that utilized it, Champion Motorsports. So their main challenge was that uh, they really couldn't make carbon fiber tubes or ducts that met their consistent quality and really met um, the designs that they wanted to do this with their normal conventional layup tools. Um, so utilizing FDM allowed them to fabricate the desired interior and exterior surfaces that they really needed for these high performance uh, parts. So they created a uh, really created parts that they were just previously totally unattainable or, or in completely impractical. Um, and it really streamlined their manufacturing process. We've also seen, we've also seen this similar thing being done um, with, say, NASCAR, where they need parts in, you know, they need replacement parts in a matter of weeks or a week or even days, and they just can't fulfill that with traditional tooling or traditional manufacturing methods. So this, because these tools can be printed in hours and even just, just overnight, uh, we, can, we can get these parts to them in, in the time that they needed rather than having to stock up um, on the parts beforehand. That was all I had for traditional toolings uh, for manufacturing processes. But we got a little bit more time, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some other areas uh, where metal tools can be replaced, just briefly. So if you're looking at the manufacturing floor, there is a lot of metal going on, and there's a lot of things where you don't realize don't need to be metal. A lot of things are just traditionally, uh, it's just aluminum. We have CNC's. We machine aluminum because that's what we have available, and we have machinists to do that. But if you're, uh, there's, there's a lot of areas where we can improve on that, uh, anywhere from quality control to assembly, packaging and logistics, um, health and safety, equipment, all sorts of stuff out there. So 
if we're, say, designing a tooling aid in the inspection and QC process, so that rather than using your traditional, you know, CMM little stands and bolts and nuts that you normally would use that could take, you know, an hour, two hours just to set up prior to using your CMM, you could just 3D print a custom fixture that holds your part and takes five minutes to install rather than an hour. And an assembly, same sort of deal. Uh, if, a cut, if it takes, you know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half to assemble a tool because there's, uh, because it ergonomically it's hard to hold or it's hard to access. Being able to just quickly 3D print a tool, uh, custom fit for that assembly can really speed up the, the, process, the assembly process uh, by aiding the workers, helping them align parts. Same with packaging logistics, obviously. Uh, and health and safety is a, is a really good one, too, for preventing people from placing their hands where maybe they shouldn't be. So typical manufacturing department tools. Here's a nice big list just to get your just to get you thinking, just to kind of hopefully get your blood flowing and thinking, well, man, there's a lot of things that I could replace or things that I could add that our company doesn't currently have. You know, check gauges and test fixtures, hand and wrist guards for health, bumpers and other ergonomic conversions, alignment tools, hand tools, surrogate tools, end effectors, drill guides. A drill guide could be a great one. You know, how long does it take sometimes to set up manual drilling and do it, do it accurately and consistently? Being able to just 3D print a drill guide and add some metal inserts uh, could really help, I think, a lot of companies. And here's kind of an idea of these metal inserts. So you can see here's just an, an idea of some of these plastic parts that would traditionally just be machined. Um, and, and I understand sometimes when you're machining, you need things like threads, like good threads. Well, we can easily embed components um, with threaded inserts, right? That's that's the easy thing that people have been doing for a long time now with 3D printing that I just feel like is still just being really underutilized. So any low volume production fixtures, assembly fixtures, things that you need to withstand, um, you know, withstand threads or withstand some other um, mating surfaces, feel free to just put in a press insert, a metal sleeve or a threaded insert. Uh, and really this is being able to do that, it's really only possible with FDM when it comes to plastics 3D printing. So that's about all I had. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, there are <laughs> there are a couple of questions. The first one that that I see came in uh, was asking about the FDM tool pictures didn't look like FDM. Specifically, how did you get them so smooth? Yes. So I'm assuming you're talking about the sand casting, like these pictures right here. So these parts were uh, they were they were post processed, so they were sanded. Um, using different grits. They were also probably, in this case, I think what Melron had is they did uh, some solvent smoothing. So because it's ABS, uh, we can use acetone um, to sort of, I don't want to say melt the plastic. It does melt it if you use too much. But with a very light coating of acetone or a quick acetone dip or vapor dip, um, we can use that to smooth those layer lines really well on top of sanding. Um, as well, when you're doing these sand castings, um, using a filler uh, on top of that or spraying on, uh, spraying on like a master coat, master foundry coat um, on top to also help smooth or a, or a paintable or a, sorry, a sandable paint as well um, can be used on top of that uh, just to make those parts look really smooth. And that's especially important with sand casting specifically just because you don't want the sand to tear from any of those layer lines and those ridges. All right, I think you covered it. Thank you very much. Uh, another one mm -hmm. is commenting on the 3D printed fiber layup tool. Are there any materials that could survive an autoclave? Probably referring to that aerospace example. Yeah, absolutely, Ultem. So these, these parts you see right here, um, Ultem, which we have 9085 and Ultem 1010, uh, both of them can withstand autoclaves. Yep, they absolutely can. There is a, uh, I don't, I, we do have some, some numbers of the temperatures they can withstand, the CTEs and things like that. So if you want to get into some of those details, um, be sure to contact us and we can kind of work with you to see exactly how well it fits in your scenario. But, yep, old Tim 1010 is going to be my go-to for that. Which, Cody, that is a perfect segue into the next question, is which machines run old Tim 1010? Aha! We have... Two machines that run it. We have the Fortis 450 and the Fortis 900, I believe. Just those two. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the 450 and the 900. The 450 is kind of the workhouse that's sort of right in the middle. The 450 does the most materials out of all of our machines. 
Um, and the 900 is our biggest one. So the 900 is, has a build size of about three feet by two feet by two feet. So you're going to see these sorts of tools. Uh, like, again, I guess the ones that you'd see here that this looks maybe almost two feet long, that's going to be done in our Fortis 900. Perfect. Last question that I see. If someone wanted to try a 3D printed tool in their company, is that something that you could help them with before they uh, yes. purchase the machine? Absolutely. That is, that is really like my job. That, that is why me and the other 80s are here. We are here to help you figure out the application beforehand, um, whether it's before you buy the machine or after. We are here to kind of walk, go through that process with you and just bring whatever resources we can to the table. Um, to go through that process and see if it works out. So absolutely, if you, if you are wanting to go down that path, let us know, and we have the tools and the people to help you. And that looks like you covered them all. Thanks, Cody. Yep, absolutely. And here's the list of the upcoming webinars we have as well. Well, thank you, everyone, thank for, you for, tuning in. for joining yep. us, Cody. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Learned a ton. I'm sure everybody else did as well.